think I've had a podcast with Jeff about hard gainers where it's like the assumption that you're even a hard gainer in, in our coaching experience as 3DMJ is oftentimes, and you can speak more to this, Jeff, like you're not eating enough, you're not taking care of you're not sleep, you know, you're doing too much activity, like all those kinds of things. Is that accurate, Jeff? That Well, I think, I mean, everybody's human, right? So to yeah. say like we have everything in order at all times, 24 seven mm-hmm. for a full year, two years straight, it's like, it's rare. You're gonna find someone who's perfect with everything all the time. So that's to me, like as a coach, like you could, those are the boxes you gotta check to make sure those things are in order, sleep, nutrition, um, et cetera, et cetera. And also too, you gotta think about um, perception. Like a lot of people, perceive their hard gainers and maybe their expectations aren't too realistic. Like maybe they think mm-hmm. they need to be growing like me or like a Birdo or like Eric or whatever. But the reality is, is that that's not, let's say their genetic level. So sometimes you have to take that in consideration. And I've had conversation with people about that with hard gainers that they think they're hard gainers. In reality, they're they're actually making progress. It's just in their mind, it's not at the expectation level level as someone they're looking up to. Right. Who's been doing usually it's like, oh, I don't look like I've these people who've been lifting since for ten years and I've done this for three years. Why am I not? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I did have one hard hard gainer. Um and Eric probably remembers this because I asked for his help. Like we, did, I threw everything at this guy. I threw the kitchen sink at him. And how rude! No, no progress whatsoever. And um, what I learned though is that about a year later, maybe or a little longer, and I didn't have any contact with him after that uh, for that full year. He came back and told me he had sleep apnea, and he showed me some pictures after, and he made progress. Wow! It's like so, so he did have like something that was there that I really didn't know about it. And um, he basically said, hey, man, uh, you know, this is not something that, you know, you sh- you would have known or anything like that. He's like, you know, I just basically, you know, learned it and and got, you know, a breathing machine and all that. So when he sleeps, it's a lot better quality sleep and it changed things. So a lot of those those things that you talked about, like in his question, the guy made sure to say, hey, my sleep's in order. This is in order. This is in order. This is in order. But <laughs> are those are the things like- muscle mass. Yeah. Train and eat correctly. That's also, again, an assumption. Yeah. Um, sleeping enough, low stress levels. Um, so that has to be in line, like, like more consistent than not. Like that has to be in line like 90% of the time, you know? We're human. It's not always going to be perfect, but if we can strive for 90%, then yeah, you're probably going to see better progress regardless. Yeah. I just remember in the 80s and 90s, you look at some of the old, not, not that old, but older publications, and this was like way before the boom of natural bodybuilding, and when people were pretty much just reading muscle magazines and their expectations were colored by the IFBB Pro ranks, there were publications where they talked about hard gainers all the time. And every time I met somebody, like, well, you know, I'm a hard gainer. Like, they would self-identify as that. And I think that's exactly what Jeff is talking about, is expectations. You've got 80%, maybe not 80%, but you've got, like, if we look at the data, if you just take a random sample of uh, people in a training population, um, if you look at endurance adaptations, a small percentage of them would be, quote-unquote, low responders who do better with who get a similar VO2 max response with doing more volume of cardiovascular training. I have no reason to believe there wouldn't be a similar genetic distribution for hypertrophy or strength, right? So if we accept that observation that maybe, I don't know, 10% of people are inherently physiologically hard gainers, but sometime in the 80s and 90s before people really thought about the fact that all these dudes are genetically gifted and on gear, something like 40, 50% of people thought they were hard gainers. That tells us it's largely about expectations. Um, so yeah, if you expect to be looking amazing and making huge progress and putting multiple inches on your, your biceps every time you, you do, you're on a training program that you get out of a magazine and that only happens the first two times and it's half of what they told you, well, I must be a hard gainer because everyone's getting this. They wouldn't put, a, put out a magazine to 2 million people that, that is lying to them. No, that's all the magazines. That's exactly what happened. So, and we get the same thing now during social media, like the whole reason the person has 50,000 or 500,000 followers or multiple titles is because they're an outlier. And yes, social media makes you think everyone's an outlier, but the reality is 
here, and a great example is the USAPL classification system. Like a class two lifter is stronger than 75% of other power lifters, probably stronger than 99% of the people on the planet. But a class two lifter is someone who feels completely inadequate and even gets made fun of on Instagram because that would be a 93 kilo lifter, for example, who can squat like 380 or something like that. I mean, all you got to do is walk into a gold, like scroll through your IG feed and you feel inadequate or like you're, you know, all everybody so jacked and then go to golds and you'll be like, oh, there's like three jack dudes of these 50 that I'm looking at. Like it's just exactly not how the world is. Um, so the more of a, uh, uh, to go back to his question, right? So is it possible, you know, your hard that you have to do, you're going to keep having to do more and more volume, more and more volume, but then you can't recover from it. So then you're just stuck. Like that's not, that's a, not real. It's just inaccurate. No. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, I guess if you were like in really, really poor shape, but some of the factors that would make someone a physiological hard gainer means that yes, they may respond better to more volume, but they're in probably inherently better at recovering from more volume. Um, and it's not going to keep increasing that much. There'll be a probably a required increase if you want to go from late stage novice to late stage intermediate. But from there, I have almost never observed that the ticket to get someone to make high level progress once they have crossed over to being an intermediate was just do more. It's more like figure out a way to optimize a lot of things. And then the needle moves. The needle doesn't jump again. But I have definitely seen the needle jump. Like you you exhaust someone's newbie gains on a minimalistic approach. And then you substantially increase their volume. And they make almost newbie-like gains again for a year. I've definitely seen that many, many times. But that's not going to happen like every five years after that. <laughs> no. Like like that was, that was for me when I went from a... Um, being stuck in a high 400s deadlift to then rapidly getting to a 550 deadlift. That was me doing a lot more work and just training as hard as I still do today, where I'm now slowly moving the needle, hopefully. Fingers crossed.